So, take it away, Jody. This, I don't need to tell you the title of this talk. You know it. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Ed, and thank you all for being here today. Thank you to the Lovettsville Historical Society for the very kind invitation to come and talk about one of my obsessions. Um, so I have very much grown up with um, George Alfred Townsend and Gapland. Uh, geographically, I'm from a community called Locust Valley, which is about two miles north of Burkittsville, right up along the base of South Mountain um, and a mile away from the um, Gathlin State Park, as it is known today. I grew up with stories my grandmother would tell me of uh, in her younger years, in her teenage years. Uh, Gathlin at the time was an abandoned ruin, and it was the cool place for all the teenagers to go hang out. Um, and she would talk about going up there and seeing all these grand old buildings crumbling into ruin. Um, my grandfather, who was a house builder, um, used marble that he had bought from someone who had taken from Mar <laughs> from Gapland, uh, used it in his fireplaces and other things in the houses that he built. And my parents were married under the arch. Um, so <laughs> lots of uh, reasons to have an interest in George Alfred Townsend and uh, in Gapland. But it's um, even more than that, because when you start to learn about this man and what he created there, um, I think it's endlessly fascinating. Um, I think Gapland, and I and I will say at the beginning, I will mostly refer to it as Gapland, G-A-P-L-A-N-D. That is the historic name. That is what George Alfred Townsend called it. Um, Gathland, as we know it today, came about when the state developed it into a state park in the 1950s. Um, they used Gath, which was George Alfred Townsend's pen name. Um, in creating that name. But Gap Lind is the historic name. That's what um, George called it, and that's mostly what I will call it as well. It was Lloyd Quantrill who brought George Alfred Townsend to the Middletown Valley in 1884. Lloyd is the protagonist in Townsend's novel, Katie of Catoctin, uh, which was published in 1886. And if you read the opening chapter of Katie of Catoctin, it almost reads like an autobiography. This quote from Lloyd Quantrill is the most evident to that fact. Quote, what would I do if all this were mine on both sides of the mountain? Why, I would clean out the whole region like a Norman king and make it a hunting park. The wolf should howl again to make the mountains romantic. My castle I would put on the South Mountain. Right here would I stand. And so with that opening lines out of the Cadia Catoctin, George Alfred Townsend did exactly that. Um, he fell in love with this place. Um, at the time, it would have been mostly known to people as Crampton's Gap. Um, it is a natural gap in South Mountain. Um, it had been the scene of fighting during the Civil War in 1862 during the Maryland campaign. It was one of the three gaps that the uh, Battle of South Mountain was fought in. Um, but it certainly um, gained a whole new life um, once George Alfred Townsend became involved with it. Townsend was 43 years old when he came to the Middletown Valley in 1884. He was born on January 30th, 1841 in Georgetown, Delaware, and Townsend was the first child of the Reverend Stephen Townsend and Mary Fleming Milburn Townsend. Townsend's father was a Methodist Episcopal minister. He was a circuit rider who traveled up and down the Delmarva Peninsula serving his various churches, and as a child, George accompanied him on these uh, travels. And George... Uh, wrote about this in one of a, one of his many lengthy poetical addresses, as he called them, um, a quote of which is on the slide here, um, which he delivered in 1902 at Old Drawers Presbyterian Church in Odessa, Delaware. And these stories would become the basis of Gath's writing later in his life. Um, in 18... Um, in the early 1880s, he published a book called Tales of the Chesapeake, which is a compilation of short stories and poems, which he drew from stories that he heard following his father around as a child on the Delmarva Peninsula. 
Um, and then he also um, relied on stories that he had heard um, for writing his 1884 novel entitled The Entailed Hat, which actually was the precursor to Katie of Catoctin, which brought him here. The Townsends enjoyed a relatively elevated status. Um, there were two children, George and a younger brother uh, named Ralph Milburn Townsend. And at the age of 19, Ralph graduated from medical school and became um, a noted surgeon and medical writer. And sadly, he died at the age of 31 in 1877 from sudden onset lung disease. In his last months, he kept a diary, which was later published under the title, The Diary of an Invalid Physician. George Alfred Townsend attended local schools in Delaware and worked his summers on farms for some of the members of the churches that his father served. But at the age of 12, the family moved to Philadelphia and George's father decided to pursue, pursue his own career in medicine. Um, and so in Philadelphia, Gath began to really foster his writing voice. Um, in school, his work gained recognition, and he actually received a job offer from the Philadelphia Inquirer, which became the first newspaper that he was associated with as a journalist. At the beginning of the Civil War, Townsend was 21 years old, and he was put on assignment by the New York Herald to follow the Army of the Potomac on the Peninsula Campaign. This would be his first foray as a war correspondent. Townsend developed Camp Fever on that campaign and ended up sailing to uh, England and spending nine months there um, after being transferred to European correspondence. And then he spent another year traveling around Europe as a bohemian, which was an experience he later wrote about in one of his books. And at the time he tried his first effort at fiction writing. He wrote a manuscript called The War Correspondent, but sadly could not find a publisher. In 1864, Townsend returned to the United States um, and to the still ongoing Civil War. He was redeployed um, to follow the army, and he did so throughout the last major battles of the Civil War. Um, he was um, attached to General Philip Sheridan's troops, and he um, covered the battles of Seven Pines, Fair Oaks, Cedar Mountain, Five Forks, the fall of Richmond. Um, but what truly made his name very well known uh, came in the spring of 1865. Townsend at that time was a reporter for The World, which was a New York newspaper. And he was their correspondent in Washington, D.C. in the spring of 1865 um, when the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln took place. His coverage of the assassination, of the um, pursuit of John Wilkes Booth, and then the trials of the conspirators were read by thousands of people across the country. And Townsend um, really built his name through that coverage. Um, he later published two works relating to this portion of his life. His first actual published book was the Life, Crime, and Capture of John Wilkes Booth, which was a compilation of all of his correspondence covering the events of April 1865. Um, but he also published a book called Campaigns of a Non-Combatant, which was a memoir of his time following the armies during the Civil War. Um, so this was where his beginning was as a writer, as a journalist, um, and what would eventually build the career that enabled him to build Gap. Just a few months after these events, Townsend married Elizabeth Bess Evans Rhodes of Philadelphia on December 21st, 1865. The next year, they traveled to Europe together um, while Townsend was reporting as a correspondent during the Austro-Prussian War. While the couple were living in Paris, their first child, a daughter named Genevieve Madeline, was born. After returning stateside, George and Bess established themselves in Washington, D.C., and also a second residence in New York City, and a second child, a son named George Alfred Jr., was born in January 1874. Townsend really um, built his career in newspapers. He was, um, has been considered the first syndicated journalist in the United States. His correspondence was read and published in hundreds of newspapers across the country. Um, and he wrote under this pen name, Gath, which was his sign off on the correspondence. And so people knew that name across the country, even if they didn't really know who George Alfred Townsend was, 
or how he had gotten um, to that level. Um, it's reported that at the height of his career, his correspondence, um, and he also did get into newspaper ownership um, and management in part of his career, was bringing him an annual income of around $100,000, which was significant um, in the time period. Um, that's only during the very kind of height of his um, popularity, though. Um, but he also built at that time a massive library, which he then kept in his home in Washington, um, of about 8,000 volumes. Um, that later would come to Gaplet. By his late 30s, George was really craving to delve into creative writing. He had spent years as a journalist, um, but he had always been interested in writing other types of literature. He wanted to write fiction. He wanted to write poetry. He really wanted to be seen um, in the same grouping as other noted authors of the time period, in particular, uh, Mark Twain, or Samuel Clemens, because Clemens had a bit background in newspapers as well before he really made his name as a novelist. Townsend very much wanted that for himself too. Actually, the two had lived together briefly in DC um, around the Civil War um, years. There's a, a photograph of um, Townsend, Mark Twain, and David Gray together that's in the Library of Congress. That's quite interesting. So in 1880, um, Gath published his first um, effort into this area of writing, and that was Tales of the Chesapeake, which I mentioned earlier. And then he followed that up four years later with the novel The Entailed Hat. Now, Gath never achieved a lot of fame or made a lot of money off of his novels. But The Entailed Hat was his most successful effort in, in fiction. Um, and what he actually was writing is what we would today term as historical fiction. He was taking historical events, people, fictionalizing them, building storylines around them. He, Townsend is very committed to depicting scenery and setting, um, which certainly is because of his background in journalism. Um, and so his work is very descriptive, almost too much so. <laughs> um, when you're trying to read it, there's a lot of detail lavished on the settings of the landscape, um, which in some cases is very interesting to read, especially in the quote that I shared earlier from Katie of Catoctin. Uh, the Entailed Hat, <coughs> excuse me, follows uh, the true historical figure of Patty Cannon on the eastern shore of Maryland. Patty Cannon was part of the Cannon Johnson gang, which um, in the years before the Civil War was trafficking both free and um, freedom seeking uh, black people and selling them into slavery in the South. Um, and that is the story around which Gath built the entailed hat. He actually, the story is told from the perspective of a journalist who is uncovering the story and telling the story. And the entailed hat did become fairly popular. It, relative to his other efforts in literature, it was the one that performed the best. And he also did get fairly good um, critical review of the entailed hat. Um, so following up on that success, we arrive at Katie of Catoctin. The characters of Katie were instantly recognizable to its readers. Through the use of fictional stand-ins, Gath wove a narrative of life in central Maryland beginning in October 1859 and running through uh, the summer of 1865. So it begins with John Brown's raid, that scene that I read the quote from with Lloyd Quantrill. A few lines after that, he meets this strange bearded gentleman who's walking through the woods on the mountain. It is John Brown. Um, and the story starts there and runs all the way through the assassination of Lincoln. Um, and it's used as the background for this romance between Katie and Lloyd. Um, the book was published in 1886, and actually, um, at that point, Gath had already started buying land and building Gapland, and so the local press had a very, had a, a growing interest in this man and what he was doing. Um, the Hagerstown Herald and Torchlight carried advertisements for Katie of Catoctin and mentioning how it was set in the local uh, landscape and the local communities. Um, but the reviews for Katie of Catoctin were not great. Um, one reviewer uh, criticized Townsend for saying that um, 
the events that he used in, in the book telling the story were just not something America was ready to have as the backdrop to a fictionalized romance. Um, they weren't ready to read uh, sort of a fictional take on the traumatic events of the 1860s. Um, that, of course, would change in time uh, quite drastically. But um, for Gath, Katie of Catoctin did not prove to be a very popular work. But the greatest legacy of Katie of Catoctin is Gathland itself. Because it was during his research and writing um, process of Katie of Catoctin that Gath first came to the Middletown Valley and that he first saw Crampton's Gath. And he became mesmerized by the setting. Um, he thought that it was an incredibly beautiful place. He appreciated the history that was in that site. Um, he certainly knew about the Battle of South Mountain, even though at the time that that battle occurred, he was in Europe um, recovering from camp fever um, from his first efforts as a, a correspondent. But he knew that a battle had taken place there. He knew that it was a significant spot. This postcard depicts Gapland around the year 1900. This is kind of at the end of Gapland's heyday. Um, things would begin to go downhill um, not too long after this very lovely image was recorded and actually distributed as a postcard that you can see an original one up here on the table. Um, you can see in this postcard the first house that Gath built at Gapland. It's the white frame building that is right next to the windmill um, with the red roof. That house was called Ascalon. Ascalon uh, comes from the Bible. It actually comes from the same verse that Gath took his pen name from. Um, it's in 2 Samuel, and it is, tell it not on Gath, publish it not on the streets of Ascalon. Gath was actually his initials, G-A-T, George Alfred Townsend, plus the H. But Ascalon, he used in naming the first house that he built at Gapland. And it would be the only frame house that he constructed at Gapland. Everything else at Gapland was masonry. It was all stone. Um, but Ascalon was the first um, effort that he, um, the first building that he put up at Gapland. Um, it's likely that in the early years, it was where he and Bess and their children would stay when they came to Gaplin because Gaplin started out as a seasonal residence. It was something he was kind of working on on the side and it was going to be um, a summer residence um, that would change over time. Just two years after he began building at Gaplin, a reporter from the Los Angeles Times described Gaplin as follows, quote, the site is a magnificent one and its owner has seen its advantages and seized upon them. He has built a country home, which for comfort, elegance, uniqueness, and individuality is not equaled by any residence of any other literary man in America. Pretty glowing uh, description. And this was very early um, in Gaplin's evolution. Um, it would become much more magnificent as time went on. 1885 was a pivotal year in the development of Gaplin. Gath wrote that, quote, the first year or two I was at Gapland, I built 2,000 to 3,000 feet of stone wall, picked the ground of the gap clear of rocks, and commenced lawn and patches for cultivation. By the next spring, I had three houses. He may have been exaggerating a little bit there. Those houses were not complete in the next spring, uh, but he certainly was developing uh, Gapland rapidly. So the first house, which I mentioned was Ascalon, was followed by a second stone structure, which came to be known as Gapland Hall. And that's what you can see in the center of this photograph. The original portion of that building is still surviving today up at Gapland. So if you're familiar with Gapland and the two buildings that house the museum exhibits, the upper one is the hall. And the one that's down in front of it is the lodge, which we'll talk about in a minute. When Gath built the first section of the hall, he actually designed it to be his library. This was the first library at Gapland. Um, it the whole first floor was the library, and then it had two bedrooms above it. He would soon, however, expand that structure with an L-shaped wing that extended off the south or back side of the original library portion. And <laughs> this portion 
of the hall was the probably the most architecturally um, succinct <laughs> building that Gath built. Um, it was all designed um, actually to mimic another author's house, which I'll show you in a second. But here's a description of it from 1886 from the Frederick News. Quote, the library walls are two feet thick, built of old red sandstone of which South Mountain is one giant dike and its chimney is nearly 10 feet wide and can hold logs five feet long. The wainscoting is four feet high and the library ceiling and beams are of yellow pine varnished and the mantle is of Albert Durer tiles. These tiles are described in another account of the time as having scenes of Shakespeare's plays painted onto them. Um, so when he added the L-shaped wing to the back of Gathlin, to, to the back of the library, this section of the house, he modeled very closely on Washington Irving's house, which is called Sunnyside, which is in the Hudson Valley up in New York State. Um, so <laughs> to kind of look at Gaplin Hall in detail, if you notice that porch that extends off the L, the back wing with the arched opening, that's copied directly from the front porch of Sunnyside. He also copied the step gables, the Dutch style gables and the dormer windows that are set partially into the upper wall and then carry over into the roof structure itself. Um, so that he copied all from Sunnyside. It's the only building at Gaplin that um, he appears to have done that though. Everything else at Gaplin seems to have been purely of Gath's mind, imagination, creativity, but, well, with the exception of the arch, we'll talk about that, but of the other buildings, this is the only one that we can actually look at and see that he was directly kind of copying something else. Um, this is a view of the hall from the west side. So the view that I shared before, this is looking from the east. This is coming up from Burkittsville on Gaplin Road, looking up towards the hall. And this is what it would have looked like standing up on the main area of the um, estate looking towards Gaplin Hall. Um, he improved this building over time. When he later built a separate building, which became the Den and Library, Gaplin Hall became the primary residence on the estate. And actually, for many years, it was considered his wife Bess's building. It was her part of the estate. It was where she spent her time, where she had her um, things. Um, we know very little about what was in Gaplin Hall, except for one piece, a prized antique that Gath had, which was a tall case clock that he had bought in um, Odessa, Delaware. It actually was from the old drawers Presbyterian Church. And that is mentioned in newspaper accounts as having been in Gaplin Hall. Um, but amid all this unique blend of Queen Anne style and Dutch gables, the hall was adorned with sculptures. You can see in the niche in the back wall, this um, sculpture of a figure that's kind of leaning out. Beneath it, there was a marble um, plaque in the wall that had another Bible verse in it. In this case, it was Ezekiel 20, 22, 30. I sought for a man that should stand in the gap before me for the land, um, possibly where he drew the name Gapland from. Um, so in addition, so the hall is the second of these three buildings that are the earl oldest ones at Gapland. The third is a building which Gath called the Lodge. And that's the building that you can see on the left side of this photo. So the hall is up behind it and the lodge is sitting down in front of it. Um, the lodge was the primary entertaining space at Gapland. It contained a dining room, it had kitchens beneath, and it had guest rooms overhead. Um, and this was where the family dined when they were entertaining. This was where they would um, have their guests um, share meals. And um, in this, this really, this view is probably one of the earliest photographs to survive of Gapland. You can tell because the hall does not have its porches built onto it yet. It just has the open um, sort of patios around it. And you can also tell by the size of the trees um, around the um, estate 
So Gath did not stop with these first three buildings. In 1887, he built a stone barn on the north side of the estate between the um, Carriage House, which is seen on the left in the postcard view, and Ascalon House, which is on the right, the barn in the center. Um, this is a was a massive structure, um, and he actually designed it so that it could be converted into guest rooms at some point, should that need have arisen. Um, it had a balcony, which extended the whole way across the front uh, that afforded views to both the Middletown Valley on the east and the Pleasant Valley on the west. Um, and we do know from his correspondence and from newspaper accounts at the time, some of the agricultural exploits that Gath was engaged in at Gapland. He kept horses at Gapland. He kept chickens. He did have a chicken house. Um, he planted an orchard of 200 apple trees. There's one account that says that he planted 600 grapevines at Gapland. And we do know that the windmill that you can see in the postcard, he purchased and installed that to operate an irrigation system to water the gardens um, at Kaplan. In 1889, Gath sold his house in New York City. And from that point on, Kaplan became a year-round residence for the Townsends. They still maintained their house in Washington, D.C., um, but they increasingly spent more time at Kaplan. Um, and that same year, he also began constructing what would become the largest building at Gapland, um, which was known as the Den and Library. So that's what you see in this photograph. The section of the house to the left with the gambrel roof and the dormers is the original portion of the complex. 24 feet in width, 45 feet in length. The library was built of stone with 12 foot ceilings of yellow pine with oak panels. There was a massive brick fireplace. You can see a little bit of it on the right side of the, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, on the right side of the photograph there, um, which according to some newspaper accounts could hold logs seven feet long, five feet long in the hall, seven feet long in the library. Um, above the mantelpiece, there were two five foot terracotta caryatids that framed a mirror and appeared to hold up the ceiling in the library. Um, and the room was filled with artwork, sculpture, pieces from Gath's extensive collections. Um, there is a, uh, there was a billiards table, which you can just barely see in the bottom corner of the picture here. But that billiard table is interesting for another Burkittsville property. You may be familiar with a farm on the east side of Burkittsville called the Hamilton Willard Schaefer Farm. It's currently being preserved. Um, and restored, and it was the headquarters of General William B. Franklin during the Battle of South Mountain. Um, there is a wing that was built onto that house to accommodate that billiard table uh, because Hamilton Willard Schaefer bought it from the first tax sale that took place at Gapland in 1907, um, and he built an entire wing onto his house to accommodate it. <laughs> Um, but here it is in its original setting. Um, along the patio that ran along the side of the library, um, there were terracotta panels set into the wall. And I've tried to find a description of what they depicted because all of the decoration that Gath used typically had some symbolic meaning. Um, and, and he intentionally chose that symbolism, um, that allegorical or mythological figure or whatever it was depicting, but I have yet to find exactly what those um, panels uh, had on them. Um, but nonetheless, we do know that the little sunroom on the left side there of the library had stained glass windows, including a stained glass coat of arms for the Townsend family. You can actually, if you look really closely through the window behind at the very back there, you can see the stained glass illuminated um, in the um, observatory. In 1891, Gath added another section to this building, which you can see in the photo on the right. That became known as the Den. So from that point forward, it was the Den and Library, but it was one L big L-shaped building. Um, the two were attached at the point where you can see the spire above the roof line there. Um, 
the den contained 15 rooms. It had a kitchen, its own dining room, smoking rooms, study and gallery spaces, um, a number of bedrooms. There are different accounts of exactly how many bedrooms were in the den. Um, and we, this is the one building apart from the arch that we do know the name of the builder. The newspapers reported that the den, um, when it was being constructed in 1891, was being overseen by a man named Singleton Allball. Singleton Allball was a contractor from Burkittsville. And there is, his name does show up in some of the correspondence that survives between Gaff and his wife, um, that he, we think he was working on other parts of Gaffland as well. Um, but this is the one of, one of Gaff's buildings that we do know the name of a builder and architect who was working with him to make his vision come to light. Some of the best descriptions of Gaff and Gapland, of his design tastes, of the architecture, uh, were made in reference to this building. And that's partly because once this was completed, this was Gaff's building. The hall was Bess's domain, and this was Gaff's domain. Um, and this was where he would welcome reporters, interviewers who came to see him at Gapland, um, and they frequently described this building um, in pretty great detail. One of the best descriptions comes from 1907. There was an article published in the Baltimore Sun by W.R. Hamilton, and this is how he described Gath's architecture. It says, quote, the disregard of architectural unity is not displeasing nor is the very variety of ornamentation. There's seeming unrestraint in decoration, but softened tones make the different colors concordant. While the parts rivet the attention of the observer, like delicate lacquer work, the whole is charming. Pretty generous description of this uh, man's uh, creation. So while Hamilton attended to harmonize the disparate elements of Gath's architecture, uh, Lee McCardle, in his 1940 article, American Gothic, The Life and Death of Gath, was not so courteous. He described Gath's building practices as follows. He built as the spirit moved him, or perhaps as money was available. Apparently without plan or design, the result was a fascinating architectural nightmare of crow steps and stained glass windows, a mixture of brick, sandstone, and mountain freestone studded with terracotta busts, medallions, horse heads, English, Dutch, Chester Allen Arthurian. According to the way you looked at it, the inside was as amazing as the out, ribbed oak ceilings, gargantuan fireplaces, terracotta caryatids, Persian tile, 18 inch doorways leading into angular halls with steps going up and more steps going down into the same room. <laughs> the Denon Library are also, to my knowledge, the only building at Gaplin for which interior photos survive. Um, and you can see here <laughs> one of those photos in addition to the one that I showed before. Um, in 1891, Hagerstown photographer William B. King visited Gapland and photographed the estate at Gath's invitation. Um, and in addition to that first photograph, this shot and the one that I'll show after it um, depict the interior of the Denon Library, and they show it to really be the labyrinth that it was. Um, plush sofas and chairs with framed um, items on the walls, porcelain figures and vases, bronze sculptures on metal, marble pedestals. Um, Gath stored his extensive uh, collection of artwork, historical artifacts, and books in the Denon Library. Um, he eventually pretty much combined what he had previously had in, George, in Washington and in New York at Gathland. This is how he described his library. He says, quote, I commenced to buy articles of instruction and embellishment very early and have gradually filled in the outlines of my library until it is probably more effective than any newspaper man's library in this country. It may be said to commence with aids to expression, such as books on philology, foreign dictionaries, concordances, whatever, being upon the spot aids the memory without looking at it as is often the case with a book. Next, books in fa of fact of different departments, the sciences, natural history, natural philosophy, physics, books of the trades from different periods. And among the artwork and artifacts that were described as being in the Denon Library, 
were uh, busts of Henry Clay and other political figures of America's early history, coats of arms for the Townsend family, prints of Civil War battles and battlefields, a pike from the Harpers Ferry Arsenal uh, from John Brown's raid, and also a fragment of the scaffold on which Brown was hanged in Charlestown, and an original copy of the London Gazette Extraordinary from 1759, believed to be the first known example of war correspondence covering the capture of Quebec during the Seven Years' War. My favorite photo of all the many of Gaplin is this one. Um, it really shows Gap in his natural habitat, in the, in the midst of this world that he created for himself. Um, if you go to the museum at Gaplin today, you can actually see some of those tiles that are in the mantelpiece. Those have survived and they're in the museum. But you can just see this labyrinth of rooms filled with books and knickknacks and pictures and everything from this man's incredible life and career. But much to his displeasure, uh, probably at, at points in his life, what made all of this possible was not his literary work. It was not the books of poetry or the novels. It was his newspaper work. Um, and that's what truly made Gaplin possible and made it come into being. The golden age of Gaplin was really the late 1880s and the 1890s. Um, Gaff continued as, as he brought in fortunes from his writing, from his correspondence, from lecture circuits um, to build and expand Gaplin. Um, he and Bess entertained the elite of their circle from Washington, from Philadelphia and New York. And we do know that they also invited the local neighbors to Gaplin. Um, there's an interesting relationship between Townsend and the people who lived around him um, in the Burkittsville area. Um, very early on when he started building Gaplin, he apparently invited uh, the local um, neighbors to come out to a picnic at Gaplin and they proceeded to um, avail themselves of the estate all through the night, which he considered to be very rude. Um, and he said he was not going to invite them back, but he later did. Um, but <laughs> we do know that according to newspaper accounts, they held balls at Gaplin and invited the local young ladies to come and um, attend the balls and dances. They um, held 4th of July observances at Gaplin at different times. They had picnics there and they would invite the local community to come uh, up to Gaplin. And at the same time that um, this period of sort of the, the heyday of Gaplin was taking place, Gath was also looking to really develop Gaplin into something bigger than just his personal residence and estate. Um, he formed what was called the Gaplin Improvement Company with an intent to sell lots along the uh, mountain and to encourage um, families from D.C. and Baltimore to build their summer residences at Gaplin. Of course, at the time that this was happening, Penmar, just up the uh, South Mountain um, in northern uh, Washington and Frederick counties was a booming summer resort with tons of summer residences from people in Baltimore and DC. In a few years, Braddock Heights would also develop um, a similar type of community. Gath had an interest in doing that at Gapland. Um, in 1891, the b &O Railroad renamed its station, which had previously been known as Claggetts, in Pleasant Valley on the Washington County branch, which was just one mile from Gapland. They renamed it Gapland. Um, in that year, they also built a new train station, which you can see in the photo there, likely designed by the B&O's architect, um, Francis E. from Baldwin. And um, one last element uh, that came through this era of trying to improve Gapland um, was the creation of the Gapland Turnpike. One of the items that you'll see on the table up here uh, is the seal embosser from the Gaplin Turnpike Company. Um, this um, started in 1891 when Gath invited local farmers and merchants up to the estate. They actually held the meeting in the library um, to discuss the creation of a company to improve the road, which ran from the top of the mountain at Gaplin down to the train station in Gaplin. Um, and from that, a turnpike company was formed. 
It was a stock company. Gath held a 51% majority in it. The rest of the stock was owned by several farmers and merchants from around the Burkittsville area. And the reason that they were interested in doing this was because Gapland Station was the closest railroad access to Burkittsville. Um, the, uh, otherwise, you, you were about a mile and a half, albeit over the mountain, but from Burkittsville to Gaplin Station, compared to five miles from Burkittsville down to Brunswick or to Knoxville to the trains there. Um, so they had an interest in having easier access to get to the b &O station in Gapland. Um, this turnpike um, opened in the summer of 1893, and it was one mile long. It was very likely the shortest toll road to operate in the state of Maryland. <laughs> um, and it only operated for about 10 years because the company failed to maintain the road and the Washington County commissioners um, eventually took away their license to operate as a turnpike and removed the toll and made it a public road in the county system. Um, but there is a toll house which survives. So if you're familiar with Bill Van Gilder's pottery shop up on Gaplin, um, just on the Washington County side of Gaplin Estate, the house that Bill and his wife live in is the toll house that was the built in 1892. The house that was under construction in this photo um, was a guest house that Gath built in 1891, which he called Mount Gath Lodge. This also still survives. It's a private residence. Um, so it's one of the buildings that has lasted um, at Gathland. And Gath was clearly interested in, in developing um, Gathland as an estate for its historical value, um, in addition to its natural beauty. Um, he published a, an editorial um, calling for the construction of a tour road from Gathland up the top of South Mountain to, as he put it, Mrs. Dalgren's residence, which would be the old South Mountain Inn in Turner's Gap. Um, which at the time was Madeline Vinton Dahlgren's uh, summer house. Um, and that had that road been built, it would have created a link between the three gaps, Cramptons, Foxes, and Turners, in which the Battle of South Mountain was fought in 1862. It's a route that eventually became the Appalachian Trail in the 1930s. Um, but he wanted to see this tour road uh, built uh, with Gaplin being its um, start. But of course, the most significant addition to Gapland um, and what really did turn Gapland into an attraction was a monument that Gath conceived in 1895. Um, on a piece of scratch paper, which you can see up in the left corner there, Gath sketched out a preliminary concept for this monument. And he based it off of two structures that he looked at frequently when he was waiting to get on the train at Hagerstown. The Antietam Fire Company building being one of them. So he copied the asymmetrical towers and the ranked um, rows of arches from the front of the fire hall. But then the big base arch of the monument, which is a Moorish arch, meaning that it's like a horseshoe. It comes back in at the bottom a bit instead of going straight down into the ground like a Roman arch. That he copied from the Port Cocher on the B&O train depot in um, Hagerstown. That stood on the site where the Washington County Free Library is today in downtown Hagerstown. So <coughs> Gath gave that conceptual design to a noted DC um, architect named John L. Smithmeyer to actually turn into blueprints that were then used to construct the arch. Smith Meyer um, had built a name for himself. He was part of the firm that designed the Thomas Jefferson building of the Library of Congress. Um, he also designed Healy Hall at Georgetown University. Um, he also may have designed Dahlgren Chapel uh, for Madeline Vinton Dahlgren that stands up in Turner's Gap. But he provided the blueprints for the arch and construction began in 1897 uh, with the excavation of the foundations. While the construction advanced, Gath was busy canvassing his network of friends to raise the $5,000 to build the monument. And he garnered donations from Civil War veterans, from some of the correspondents whose names would end up on the monument, um, and also from 
newspaper publishers and from a few very well-known names, Thomas Edison, George Pullman, Joseph Pulitzer, uh, and J.P. Morgan all contributed to the building of the arch. By July of 1896, newspapers report that most of the stone structure had been completed and that they were beginning to install the decorative tablets, decorative um, stone carvings, brick carvings um, into the arch. On September 18th, 1896, the timber frame that was holding up the big base arch was removed um, and the dedication for the arch was set for October 16th, 1896. Maryland Governor Lloyd Lowndes presided over the dedication of the arch and Gath delivered one of his lengthy poetical addresses uh, as he was off to do. This photograph is amazing. If you know what Gathlin looks like today, it's hard to imagine it being that wide open um, as it was um, when the arch was built. And you can see over to the um, right side, the barn, Ascalon, the windmill, the carriage house. The symbolism of the arch has been a matter of debate ever since it was built. Um, you can read all different descriptions of what different elements mean, but most agree on a few things. Um, there's a general agreement that <laughs> the figures in the uh, medallions, which appear to be terracotta, but they're actually concrete, cast concrete painted to look like terracotta, so it's more durable. Um, the, they depict the figures of... Mercury with the winged helmet and of Erato, the Greek muse of poetry and lyric. There's also another statue of Mercury, or in this case, it actually is a copy of a Greek statue of Hermes, who's the same in the two sets of mythology, um, the messenger gods. Um, there's also the horse heads, which are up in the top of the arch, depicting horses, which were the means of transportation for the Civil War correspondent traveling between the battlefield and um, his publisher. And um, there are sandstone tablets set in the monument with a poem written by Gath, its dedication, um, and with all the names of 157 uh, writers, illustrators, photographers who covered the battles of the Civil War. Um, so the arch's dedication really was kind of the, the zenith of Gath, of Gapland in George Alfred Townsend's time, because very sadly for him, um, things started to go downhill pretty quickly after the arch was completed. Um, when William, uh, when William R. Hamilton wrote his long piece on Gapland in 1907, he notes that the estate was already starting to kind of fall into disrepair in places, and Gath was still living there at the time. Um, but in 1911, Gath began selling off some of his prized collection, and he moved his library back to Washington, D.C., and spent increasingly less time at Gapland. Um, Gath's fortune had taken a hit as his continued move into novels and creative writing did not prove to be very fruitful financially for him. Um, but also the cost of building Gapland drained his finances. Um, and so this was coupled with um, family strife. He had a very strained relationship with his son, George Alfred Jr., which was very much um, a source of um, disappointment to him. Um, he was very close, however, with his daughter. And his daughter, Genevieve, married a publisher named Edmund Bonaventure, and Bonaventure actually published many of Gath's later books. Um, and so Gath did have a close relationship with his daughter. Uh, he developed diabetes later in his life, which um, became very debilitating at points. Um, and in 1903, his wife Bess died, um, which seems to have really kind of plunged him into a state of depression that he never truly emerged from. Um, and in fact, one reporter said that he never went in the hall after Bess died basically sealed it off and, and never went back into that building. Uh, George Alfred Townsend um, eventually left Gapland in 1911. Um, and actually a year before his death, he there's a newspaper article saying he was contemplating selling it. 
um, but he apparently did not have any satisfactory offers. Um, and so um, he still was holding Gapland when he died in New York City at the home of his daughter Genevieve on April 15th, 1914, at the age of 73. He was buried alongside his wife Bess um, and his parents in Laurelville Cemetery in Philadelphia. Gaplin then was inherited by Genevieve and Edmund, um, but Edmund died four years later in 1918, and then in 1920, Genevieve sold Gaplin. She sold it for $9,500. And there's not a definitive number total of what Gaplin costs to build but estimations from the archival records that survive say that it was anywhere between two hundred and five hundred thousand dollars that Gap had spent building Gapland, and it was sold for nine thousand five hundred dollars. Um, she sold it to a man named James Reed, who actually um, attempted to turn it into a hotel and resort. Um, there are advertisements placed in the Baltimore Sun calling uh, for the Gapland Inn. Um, but those ads only appear for about three years. Um, and then um, Reed ended up selling it. It sold two more times um, during the 1920s and 30s. Neither one of the buyers um, successfully did anything with the property. It just sat and fell into disrepair and ruin. Um, it was helped along by local neighbors who saw all that stone and brick and marble and stuff just sitting up there and no one doing anything with it. And helped themselves, um, and also by the mountain landscape reclaiming um, parts of the estate that had previously been cleared. Um, and so in 1943, um, oh, I should say, the one part of the estate that that did not happen to was the arch. And that's because Gath had deeded it to the War Department in 1904. And so the federal government owned the arch it actually still does today. So the park itself is state, but the little triangle where the arch sits is federal. And it's considered part of Antietam National Battlefield um, on the books. Um, so during the Great Depression in 1934, CCC men worked on the arch, restoring and repointing the masonry. Um, and the arch remained an attraction to people even as the rest of Gapland kind of crumbled around it. Um, in 1943, Gaplin was bought by the eldership of the Maryland and Virginia, the Maryland and Virginia eldership of the Churches of God, with the intention of turning it into a youth camp and a retirement home. Um, this is what Gaplin looked like when in that time period. Um, and so they very quickly decided it was not worth the investment it would have taken to do their what they wanted to do with it. Um, and they only held it for three years before selling it again. These amazing photographs were taken by A. Aubrey Bodine of Baltimore. Um, and they are incredibly beautiful, haunting photos showing what Gapland looked like in this time period after about 30 years of neglect. Um, so in 1946, the Church of God sold Gapland jointly to the Historical Society of Frederick County and the Frederick County Chamber of Commerce. And this is the first time that a party bought Gaplin with the intention of preserving it, of trying to save this historical site. And so three years later, the Historical Society and the Chamber of Commerce signed it over to the state of Maryland. Um, and the state has owned it ever since. Um, the initial plans for the park were to save as much of it as possible. There, the initial plan was to save the lodge, the hall, the Denon Library, the barn. They did tear down Ascalon House because it, as being the only frame structure on the property, it had deteriorated the most and was considered beyond saving. Um, Gathlin State Park was dedicated in 1958, and um, there was still ongoing restoration at that time. In fact, the photos of the dedication ceremony show that they used the piazza of the library as the stage and the library was still in ruins behind them but the hall and the lodge had been restored um, and the ruins of the barn had been stabilized sadly the money that would have been necessary to require to restore or or stabilize the ruins of the denon library was never appropriated and what remains of that today is one wall about this tall 
that was the edge of the piazza in front of the library, and then a big pile of stones. And actually the driveway that goes up to the parking lots in the back of Gapland run right over where the den used to sit. Um, but if you go visit Gapland today, you can see some hints of the splendor that once existed there. There are elements that are still situate in the surviving buildings or that have been reclaimed and put into newer structures, as is the case with that beautiful um, terracotta column capital that uh, frames the door to the bathroom uh, at Gapland. Um, they reclaimed them and put them in that building. There are the inscribed stones for Gath and Bess, which are in the hall and the uh, lodge. And so there are still pieces as well as things on display in the museum that can hint at the splendor of what Gap Gaplin looked like in its heyday. There's one more structure that I wanna share with you as I conclude. Um, and it's probably the most enigmatic um, at Gaplin. If you go visit there today and walk up the hill behind the museums, you will come to this kind of odd rectangle um, lawn that's cut out of the slope of the mountain and has massive stone retaining walls around it. And then a little walkway that climbs up the hill to this little stone structure. And that is Gath's mausoleum. Gath built this in 1895 and intended it to be the burial place for himself and his wife and possibly for um, George Alfred Jr. and Genevieve because there were four burial spots in the mausoleum. Um, it was built of stone. It had a brick pediment that you can see above the um, front wall. There were terracotta ornamentation on it, just like all the other buildings at Gaplin. And this zinc statue of a dog that um, Townsend had bought from the J.W. Fisk Company in New York. Um, the marble tablet that you can see um, the woman that is standing in the picture looking at it, I have not been able to find a description of what was inscribed on that tablet. It's not there today. You can actually see the metal brackets in the wall that held it. Um, and in the picture, it appears that there is something inscribed on it, um, but I do not know what it was. What remains there today is this. Um, so you can see actually over on the left side is the parking lot. Um, so it's not too far up the hill. But the most incredible part of this structure is the lintel over the stone, uh, over the doorway. Um, this stone lintel has the inscription, Good Night Gas, written on it. And that had a deep meaning to George Alfred Townsend because Good Night Gas was the sign off that he would use when he telegraphed his correspondence to newspapers across the country. For all those years, thousands of times, he signed off, good night, Gath. And so that's what he had inscribed on the lintel over the mausoleum door. Um, we know that it was carved in Hagerstown by a stonemason named John Jackson, uh, Jacob Jackson. And he had, um, the handwritten note from Gath in his script, um, in his signature, Good Night Gath, and he amplified it 10 times, according to the newspaper, to then carve onto the stone. Um, and that thankfully has survived. And so it really is, Gapland to me is, it has a very unique atmosphere when you walk around it. Um, part of it is a sadness because you know that so much of it is gone. Um, and we only have these pictures and some few artifacts to understand what all was there. But it, there is still a magic to the place um, that I think Gath very much imbued it with um, during his time there. And when you walk up the hill to see the mausoleum and you read that stone, it really kind of sets it home. So I thank you so much for journeying around Gaplin with me. Um, I'll be happy to answer questions, but I also want to encourage you to come up and explore some artifacts on this table. There are first editions of most of Gath's works, not all of them, there are a couple missing, but um, most of them there, as well as a historic portrait of Gath. And then on this table, there are artifacts from Gaplin, from the Turnpike Company. This is kind of interesting, Gath did take advantage of the state.
at least once. He allowed his name to be used by a cigar company. Um, so they made these gas cigar tins that have the pen is mightier than the sword on the side of them. If you go to the museum up at Gatlin, you can see the original weather vane, which is a pen breaking a sword that used to be on top of the arch. Um, and so that's one of the kind of funny pieces of material culture that has survived from Gatlin. Uh, also provided from the state park. And then over on the top of the organ, there are some fantastic photographs of Gatlin. Uh, point out in particular this one. And do feel do please come up and get a closer look at it. But this was an intended National Hall of Fame of Journalism that was going to be built at Gapland in the 60s. And the design had a round building. The arch is right here. It was going to sit off to the side of the arch. How they thought they were going to get the ground that flat up there, I do not know, because it's a downhill slope from the back of the arch. But it had a globe built into the center of it. And the concept was that all countries with a free press would be illuminated on the globe um, in the center of the Hall of Fame. Um, thankfully, that was not built. Um, <laughs> it's a cool concept, but I'm grateful that that did not happen, uh, that, that that intrusion to the landscape that Gap created was not to be. Um, but it is very cool to see how they were thinking about using this place early in its history as a historical attraction. So this photograph with all the rest are over there. Please feel free to look around. I'm happy to answer questions. And before we do that, your favorite moment in the Yes, if anyone has questions, please do ask, or if you want to come up afterwards and ask me, that's fine as well. But... So based on what he modeled it after, that's that's how the facade of the fire station is. It has a larger, taller tower on the one side and a shorter on the other. Um, Gath did not care too much for symmetry in his architecture. Um, when you look at the houses he built, he didn't pay too much attention to it. In some places he did, but he wasn't wedded to it. Um, I think that Gath refers to it in, um, there's a poem that he wrote about the arch that's in, this book called Poems of Men and Events. Um, and he refers to it as being designed to appear like a ruin, being designed to appear as something that has survived from ancient time. And so it wasn't supposed to be perfect. It was supposed to have a bit of an imperfection as if it were this remnant uh, um, of the past that was standing there on the mountain. It's thought that he, yeah, he intended it to be a family burial ground. He, Gath, <coughs> pretty much, I mean, according to, um, so there's a fantastic book on George Alfred Townsend and Gaplin that was written by Diane Weeb, who was the longtime um, docent up at Gapland, and I would absolutely point you to her book. It's really the best biographical treatment of Gath, and it's also really illuminative about Gapland itself. And she says that you know, Gath, all the way up until basically the end of his life, when he realized that the financial situation, the family relationship situation was probably probably meant that Gaplin was not going to remain in the towns and family. It was not going to be preserved. Up to that point, he had intended it to be something that would go down through the family um, and that the cemetery would be a family burial ground. Um, why Bess was buried in Philadelphia when she died in 1903, we don't know. That that part, that's ultimately what made the decision because then Gath was buried next to her there. Um, but to our to what is known, nobody was ever buried in in the burial ground. Oh yeah, and yeah. I just want to say that uh, I have read uh, Katie's biography. Yes, I believe it's also available. It is. Yeah. 
to me, it was probably the best historical fiction for this general area. Mm -hmm. It is. I mean, it. In what's fascinating about the book, uh, he very he, he really tried to capture not only the landscape but the people. He writes a lot of it in dialect when he's and, and reflecting the Germanic heritage of the people in the area. Um, and it is it, it's really a remarkable work. I personally of of what I've read of Gath's writing. I prefer his poetry, and I am, I will ca put a caveat on that. I'm not a literary scholar. I'm not an English major, but I, <laughs> I love his poetry. I find it quite beautiful and interesting. I love, I think that poetry was suited to his penchant for description <laughs> and his love of symbolism and his love of um, allegory. And so I do love his poems where he's describing Gapland or he's describing someplace locally. Um, and, but yes, I agree. Katie is, it's a fantastic um, view, snapshot of this area, this region in the Civil War time period. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that he didn't have a great relationship with his son. What, what happened with, what, what happened eventually with his son? What did he do? They, they did not reconcile in Gath's lifetime. Um, George Alfred Jr. did, have children, and so when um, later, um, the, so the Arch at Gaplin was rededicated in 1962 on the hundredth anniversary of the Battle of South Mountain. George Alfred Townsend Jr.'s son was there, and it was because they made a big deal about Gath's grandson being at the event. Um, so the family did have at least a tangential. Um, connection to Gapland afterward, but Gath and his son never really reconciled. What was the cause of the uh, breakdown of the relationship? From what I've read, it, it had to do with, um, I think it, uh, Gath felt that um, George Alfred Jr. had every opportunity to kind of make a good life and he felt that he didn't do it. He kind of squandered the privilege he grew up with and um, was given to vices that caused him to not um, sort of live, live a life that his father really approved of. And so he kind of felt that it was a wasted opportunity in, in some ways. Um, and he writes about, in, writes about George Alfred Jr. a lot in his letters to Genevieve. It's a frequent topic of conversation between father and daughter about this strained relationship. How popular was he as a uh, correspondent? I mean, I remember the reference points send me the uh, correspondence, say, during the Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, uh, probably much less so in more modern times. But uh, now and again, you realize that the Herald certainly is the best seller. Not the bigger the Thomas, mm -hmm. the Herald, and the Herald, at least in the, in the Peninsula campaign. Yes. Was he heavily involved? Yes. And, and and he wrote his correspondence in his usual very flowery, descriptive tone. And and there's some who have said that that's part of what aided the growth of his popularity, especially with his coverage of Lincoln's assassination, because he he conveyed it as if it was a fictional story unfolding. It's very detailed, very given to the descriptions of the people and the places and 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 it to the literary taste of the time, it was amazing. And that, that's what they really um kind of raised him up um based on. And um later in his life that kind of became his downfall because as the as the enjoyment of that type of writing <laughs> began to wane, um, he he didn't really evolve uh, beyond it. Have you read a lot of his correspondence? I have read, so part of researching for this talk, um, I gave a version of this talk five years ago in Middletown. And since then, I one of my COVID projects was to read all of Gath's correspondence that he published during the years that he was building Gapland. Um, so from 1884 up through really 1911 when he left. Um, 
And it's fascinating to read his words, to read what he, how he described Gapland. It's to us, it seems like such a eclectic, grandiose, very um, eccentric place. He speaks of Gapland very matter of factly. I built a barn. I can convert it into residences if I need to in the future, which is so weird because ordinarily he's giving, lavishing everything with detail and description. But Gaplin, in a lot of cases, he writes about it very plainly, almost matter of factly. Um, but he did write about it and he did say, I'm putting up a new library. I built a wing onto the hall. I am doing this, I'm doing that. And so you can really construct the timeline, which is what I was trying to do. Um, but people in Seattle and Los Angeles and Texas and Georgia were reading about George Alfred Townsend building Gaplin. Um, and it was, it had to be popular because they kept printing it. They, they kept uh, taking his correspondence and putting it out there. So, but he would mix it. A lot of times his correspondence um, would have two or three different topics that he was writing about. Um, so he may spend a little bit of time talking about something he's building at Gapland, and then he'll be writing about whatever political debates going on in D.C., and then he'll write about something in the world. His most um, popular selling book was actually this one called The New World Compared with the Old, which is kind of a um, sociological, political commentary, bit of a historical work. Um, it's not fiction. Um, that he wrote comparing um, politics in France and England during the 19th century to the United States. Um, and this was this was the book, uh, it was published in 1872, that he made the most money off of, of all of his published works. And have you read the war? Story? The war correspondence. I've read part of uh, campaigns of a non-combatant in which he, he writes... Um, Printed some of the correspondence in there, and also the the Booth um, correspondence, and yeah, I mean he he was they're lengthy. <laughs> I mean he filled a book with what he wrote about um, Booth and Lincoln and the conspirators. Yes. Um, with the being this big, did he have? servants and people working on the grounds. And he did. Um, so there, um, we we do know that he did have people, he employed local people actually, in a lot of cases. His gardener was um, from the Burkittsville area. One of the cooks that he employed was a sister of my third great grandfather. Um, and she also later became the toll keeper for the turnpike. Um, and she's listed in the 1900 census as a cook. Um, the uh, Ascalon house was used at times as a residence for her servants. Now there are newspapers, some of the interviews and stories that were written about Gaplin, especially after Gath's death and when it kind of became myth, they embellished um, there. There's all this, um, there's several several articles that say he had a resident live in French chef that cooked at Gapland. That's very likely not true, <laughs> um, but he did employ at least um, maids, groundskeepers, gardeners, cooks, um, and several. And from the few that whose names we do know, they were local people. Yes. What happened to the uh, Fun Valley branch railroad via you know, that that came down? So it it was called the Washington County branch. It was built after the Civil War. It split off the main line at Weaverton down along the river. Ran up through. Um, it actually, I mean, it, it created a few communities. Um, Yarrowsburg was one of them. It ran close to Brownsville. Claggetts or later Gapland was created by it. Trigo was created by it. Um, Trigo was originally Roarsville Station. Um, it was the closest that, it, that that the line went to Roarsville. It, at that point, it turned out of the middle, out of the Pleasant Valley, and headed over through Keysville and then up to ha uh, Hagerstown. And it was mainly built for hauling produce. 
because the Pleasant Valley was a huge area for fruit growing. There were, um, especially strawberries. It was a big strawberry growing area in the uh, late 19th century. Um, and it was decommissioned in the 19, late 1960s, I think, or early 70s. Um, and eventually the line, the, the tracks were removed and either taken somewhere else or scrapped or whatever. Um, there are still, well, there was still the Trigo Station um, up until about 10 years ago, I think it collapsed during a snow storm. Um, but it's, if you're familiar with Trigo, when you drive through Trigo, it sat right against the road. Um, and you can, you, the, the element of the line that is still very visible in many places is the rail bed. You can follow it for most of its its track, especially from about Gapland to Keatesville, because um, it followed closely to the roads and the road bed is still, the rail bed is still very intact um, through those areas. So this is, this is both in west of the present uh, narrow 67? Yes, yes, entirely. Uh, Except what right at the beginning, down at Weaverton, it, it, but from there on, it ran west of 67. Yeah. It followed Israel Creek for the beginning part of its um, path and then ran up to Gaplin and then turned up through Trigo and Thank you again so much. Thank you.